Okay, what the hell happened to all my stuff? And secondly, why is my shirt different? I mean, it's almost as if that there was some kind of event that I hadn't planned for which caused some kind of alteration to what I was supposed to be seeing. Wait, same. Oh man. What the... What the hell's going on around here? Crash Bandicoot. It's been a long time. We haven't spoken since, well, you know. Get inside, I'll make you a coffee. So, how have you been? Okay, look, I know we've gone through some tough issues in the past, but things are different now. I mean, I've just recently gotten myself a new review room, and you've got your, uh, your, uh, games? Hey, don't bring Sonic into this again. I thought we promised to leave all that stuff, but... Oh, crap. This scene looks tense. Better cut to the intro. Crash Bandicoot, the unofficial PlayStation mascot. Before we get into the game itself, let's talk a little bit about what the series means to me, first of all. Before my reintroduction into the Sonic series in the late 2000s, there was another platformer mascot that had my attention. Crash Bandicoot. Crash Bandicoot for me came at a time when current gen gaming was something that was beginning to disappoint me, and considering where the gaming industry was and still is today, well, let's just say that this was something of a breath of fresh air for me. My first Crash game was Naughty Dog's 1997 sequel, Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back, and it brought back a very nostalgic feeling of how games used to be back then, and if I'm completely honest here, it rekindled some of my enjoyment that was beginning to dwindle in the 2010s. And granted, while I might not be as big of a fan as I used to be, the Crash franchise is something that I do hold a fair bit of nostalgia for. I don't know, I mean, there's just something so 90s about Crash that just holds a certain appeal for me. But every 90s kid and their grandmother knows about the Naughty Dog era of Crash, and considering most people's disdain they hold for the Activision-produced Crash of the Titans and Mind of a Mutant, today we're going to be talking about the lesser-known era of Crash Bandicoot, the early 2000s. After Sony's contract with Universal Interactive Studios expired, the company that held the rights to Crash at the time, Crash migrated into a third-party property now set to appear on the GameCube, Dreamcast, PlayStation 2, and Xbox. And after publishing rights were given to Konami in the year 2000, Sonic 3D Blast developer Traveler's Tales was given 12 months to produce a Crash Bandicoot game that Universal Interactive expected to either equal or surpass its predecessor Crash Bandicoot Warped. With time running out and a schedule to be met, many concepts and ideas had to be dropped, such as the idea of a free roaming game and a dream cost port just to meet the deadline. And in October of 2001, Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex was released to a very disappointed audience. But as always, I do my best to judge a game not based on its predecessors, but how it stands up on its own. So with that in mind, let's take a look at Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex for the PlayStation 2. 
So jumping right into the plot, we begin on Cortex's space station where Uka Uka chews out his villainous cohorts for sucking at being evil because of Crash Bandicoot's efforts and beating them every time. However, it seems that thanks to Engine's remark, the player finds out that Cortex has had a secret weapon in development since his defeat and Crash Bandicoot warped. And I can only presume that there was no major side effects considering that he was turned into a baby and was lost within the space-time continuum, but moving on. Cortex soon elaborates and confirms that he does indeed have a secret weapon, but requires a power source in order to be the final element of his creation. It is with this that Uku could decides to call upon four masks known as the Elementals in order to bring Cortex's ultimate weapon to life and give him the power to conquer the world. Get ready to face my wrath, Crash Bandicoot! <laughs> Meanwhile, on Insanity Beach, Crash and the gang are just kinda kicking back until the Earth begins to suffer tremors and volcanic eruptions, which alarms the witch doctor Aku Aku to investigate. Aku Aku arrives to discover that Uku Uka has revived the elemental mask and has convinced them to join Cortex's side in awakening his ultimate weapon. Enter Crunch Bandicoot, a badass anti-villain who's not only got a cool design, but also confused with the elemental mask and utilize their powers to take Crash down. Meanwhile, Aku Aku informs Crash and his sister Coco of the situation and thus the gang descend into a hub area where Coco developed a portal chamber based upon the time twister from Crash Bandicoot Warped. And so it's up to Crash to defeat Crunch Bandicoot, the elementals, and put a stop to Cortex's scheme once and for all. For the rest of the game, however, you'll usually see intermittent cutscenes either by warping between levels or by Cortex communicating with you directly directly as Uka Uka chews power for being such a failure. After collecting 25 crystals, Crash faces off against Cortex, Crunch, and the Elementals where we learn that Crunch actually has a mind of his own but was only being mind controlled by Cortex. After a lengthy battle, an enraged Uka Uka destroys the control console which frees Crunch from Cortex's grip but also initiates the self-destruct sequence in the process. Luckily for Crash, however, he manages to rendezvous with Coco in her spaceship and escapes the destruction bringing Crunch along with him. With Cortex out of commission, Crunch befriends the gang and the world lives on another day. As for Uka Uka and Cortex on the other hand... I'll get my revenge, Crash Bandicoot! Just you wait! In the way of an overall plot, this game is about on par with the other games in the series, so if you're just looking for a very basic evil villain is up to no good and go stop them plot, then, well, you're not going to be seeing much more depth than that. So, with the story quickly wrapped up, let's jump into the gameplay. Crash's controls have remained relatively the same way they've been since Crash Bandicoot 2. You have your basic jump by pressing the X button, as well as the iconic spin attack by pressing the square button. By pressing circle or R1, Crash can enter a crouching position where he can crawl by moving the left analog stick and also make higher jumps by pressing the X button. When in a running motion, he can also perform the slide attack by either pressing circle or R1. As far as the overall controls are for Crash, it's relatively easy to pick up and play, so adapting to the basic controls should be no problem. However, much like its predecessors, the Wrath of Cortex also has a few additional gameplay styles to keep things interesting. From commandeering on-rails vehicle sections, to flying spaceships and planes, from taking control of mech suits to a helipack, Crash can utilize quite a number of things to his advantage when the level calls for it. And that's alongside returning upgrades from Crash Bandicoot Warp like the Fruit Bazooka, Speed Shoes, Tornado Spin, and Double Jump. But the question is, do these gadgets add or subtract anything from the overall gameplay? If you were to ask me... no. Many of these styles are usually interspersed within a large chunk of the regular Crash gameplay, with the only real exceptions being the flight levels. But they do add a little bit something more to the gameplay which should break up monotony a little bit. But if there was anything about the gameplay that I didn't like too much, it's the Time Lord video game complaint of water levels. Now to be entirely fair to this game, only one of these levels is somewhat tolerable thanks to the on-foot segments where you wander through Cortex's base, after a brief introduction to the swimming controls, and even then you're in a submarine for most of it anyway. But the swimming controls haven't really seen any significant improvement since Crash 3, and as you'd expect, they're clunky, really annoying, and especially when you're trying to swim past Nitro Crest to avoid the sudden touch of death. And it doesn't help that apparently normal, harmless fish can kill Crash in one touch again. Granted, the game's probably still running off 90s video game logic, but it still annoys me when something as harmless as a fish acts as if it's a hand of death and automatically kills you on touch. However, thankfully, there are only three water levels out of the 25 levels in the game, so it's really nothing to get your panties in a twist over. However, to close off this segment would be the fact that you get to play as Crash's sister Coco, much like how you did in Crash Bandicoot Warped. Her gameplay takes a much larger and, in my opinion, a much better role, as it's no longer just relegated to riding jet skis or an animal to the end of the level. And even though it does play like a somewhat stripped down version of Crash Crash's gameplay, the levels she goes through, in my opinion, are pretty cool and some of my personal favourites in the entire game. In terms of mission structure, the Wrath of Cortex takes on a similar formula to its predecessors beginning with Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back. From the warp room, there are five areas with each one dedicated to a specific elemental mask, with the fifth area being Cortex's space station. In each area, you must complete five levels by obtaining the 
Magic Crystal, which can be easily found on the linear level path, which are near impossible to miss unless of course you're intentionally trying to avoid it. After collecting 5 crystals in each area, you're able to enter a boss fight with Crunch and the Elemental Mask of that warp area. However, the game doesn't just end with collecting 25 crystals and calling it a day. No, because in order to unlock the true ending of the game, you must also collect the 46 gems as well. And it's here that I say screw it and just look up the 100% ending on YouTube because, you wanna know something? I'm not a sucker! Now to me, this was a problem that plagues most of the series up until Twin Sanity, but in Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex in particular, this game reaches a level of frustration that equals that of the first Crash game. Going through the game normally? No problem. Getting 100%? No way. Now if you're somebody who suffers from occupational health and safety disorder, or OCD as the kids call it, you're gonna be in for some serious frustration. Not that getting the gems shouldn't be a challenge, but I feel the reward for doing so just really isn't all that worth it. But if you thought that wasn't enough, then you've also got the Return of the Time Trial relics, and also five additional levels to collect gems and more relics in. But that's a criticism I only really reserve for those who are hardcore completionists, because aside from that, the game is relatively easy going, albeit with a few bumps in difficulty here and there. Overall, the gameplay is relatively decent, with a few bumps in the road here and there, with the water levels, gem hunting being a little bit more difficult than in previous games, but aside from that, the gameplay maintains the well-established formula that was established in Cortex Strikes Back. And now we get to something which I feel will determine whether or not you like this game or not. Over to the technical aspects, and graphically speaking, Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex definitely looks dated in terms of its visuals. But the weird thing is, is that the quality of the graphics radically vary between ports. And the reason I say weird is because the GameCube version is known to have the worst graphics and rendering alongside lengthy load times, which is strange because the PS2 version, a console that should be inferior to the GameCube, has put out better rendering and quicker load times of the two, and for the icing on top of the cake, the Xbox version of the game has the best graphics of all, with added fur effects on characters like Crash. But either way you spin it, no matter what version, the graphics do still very much look like something that could have came out near the turn of the millennium. However, while the game's graphics do look dated, aesthetically, I think the game does have its own appeal, completely unique to any other Crash Bandicoot game before or after The Wrath of Cortex. By comparison to many other Crash games in the series, The Wrath of Cortex is probably the darkest game in the series. Not in the same sense of a Jack 2 Renegade or a Shadow the Hedgehog kind of dark where the world and characters are there to reflect the darker tone, but rather where the aesthetics and gravity of the situation that Crash and the gang are facing are played relatively straight. I mean, looking at these kinds of environments, they're really lacking in any sort of oversaturated or vibrant colouring like the previous games such as Crash Bandicoot Warped or Cortex Strikes Back. I mean, the closest comparison I can really get for this game's kind of atmosphere was the first Crash Bandicoot game, but the Wrath of Cortex in particular seems to be intentionally choosing this art style rather than it being simply the result of early PS2 graphics. Nevertheless, though some might find the look of the game dated and the darker look unappealing, I speak for myself when I say that I quite like the artistic look of the game in many levels, but that's just me. As for the game's soundtrack, The Wrath of Cortex takes on a techno soundtrack, doing away with a lot of the cartoonish music that fans came to know in previous games. And if I may speak on my own behalf, this is my favourite soundtrack in the entire series. And I really like how the tracks are a mixture of both catchy and ambient music, as the two styles go hand in hand, with a personal favourite of mine being the track H2 Oh No. In terms of anything else, one point I will give for Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex is its voice cast, which features some pretty well-known figures such as Mark Hamill voicing the Fire Elemental, future Crash Bandicoot VA Jess Harnell voicing the Earth Elemental, as well as Ardley Ermi voicing the Water Elemental. And yes, he does do his whole Full Metal Jacket routine. Crash Bandicoot! You've got some nerve setting foot into my domain without an invitation. Don't talk back to me! I'll fix that attitude problem of yours! Let me see your war face! You got a war face? Ah! Bullshit! You didn't convince me! Let me see your real war face! Ah! You don't scare me! Work on it! This combined with returning Crash Bandicoot voice actors Clancy Brown as Dr. Cortex and Uka Uka, alongside Mel Winkler as Aku Aku, which makes for a pretty well voice acted Crash game for those who think that it has no ties to the Naughty Dog era. And the voice acting for what is worth is delivered decently, albeit with a few cringy lines because E for everyone rating. You want a piece of me, Bandicoot? Huh? Huh? Do ya? Huh? Wuss. So with all that said, what are my final thoughts on Crash Bandicoot? The Wrath of Cortex. When I first played The Wrath of Cortex, my opinions mirrored that of most Crash fans in that it was just a clunky rehash of Crash 3 with little to no innovation to be found other than the introduction of Crunch. But over the years, I think I've found something that I can finally appreciate The Wrath of Cortex over compared to the other games in the series. Does it stand up to its predecessors? Well, no, not really, but taking into consideration the time frame which Traveller's Tales had to develop the game, I'm quite surprised that it turned out as decently as it has because trust me, there are very few games that are rushed and can turn out to be actually good. 
In terms of recommendations, if you're a long-time Crash fan, then I'd only really recommend this one for people who like the formula used in Crash Bandicoot 2 and 3, as this game, despite looking like a little bit copy-paste in some places, will probably satisfy you to a varying degree. But word of warning, just don't go in expecting it to play Crash Bandicoot warped out of the water. And as for newcomers, if you like mascot platformers with an aesthetically darker touch to them, then I'd say you'll probably get some enjoyment out of this, but in terms of gameplay, I'd say results may vary depending upon your liking to the alterations of Crash's playstyle. So, with that said, I am Scully, keep it new metal. And so, Crash, what do you think? Where the hell did he go? Yeah, whatever, I'm sure it's nothing. I'm gonna go get some Pepsi.